Following the strong warning of the perils of being spiritually immature, the author of Hebrews builds further on both the teaching he began at verse 11 of chapter 5 and begins a shift back toward his earlier discussion on Christ's superior high priestly ministry. In this passage of chapter 6, verses 10 to 20, we see that the listeners have been urged to imitate those who receive the promises through faithful perseverance. Abraham is shown as an example of this perseverance. Abraham was caught in a crisis, charged with the love for his son and even greater desire to obey God. He believed that the promises of God would not fail and so he stayed on the course of God's command to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. So through the intense and long test, he became a model of God's unfailing covenant promise. He goes on to say that Abraham believed in the oath made to him by God. And we see that God comes true in his promise, even if he subjected Abraham to such a test. How strong are we in situations that require us to persevere? We see that God is true to his oath. He is firm and steadfast, and because of that, we can stay through the perilous situations. Christ is the anchor that gives us the stability, and today, we shall see in detail the inevitable hope of His anchor that has passed through the veil of the most holy place through the office of His eternal priesthood in the order of Melchizedek. Welcome, dear brothers and sisters. As we study in detail the faith in the lives of those who trust and persevere in God. Hello dear friend, this is Through the Bible. Thank you for joining us. Here we are once again to study this wonderful book. Notice again in verse 6, just as a recap, let's look at verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 6. Why don't you turn your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 6. If they fall away to be brought back to repentance because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. What is the if in this verse? Actually, the if is not in the text at all. It is having fallen away or then fell away it's a genitive absolute. It is all right to use the if provided you use it as an argument rather than in the sense of a condition. Why would it be impossible to renew them unto repentance? Remember, my dear friend, we are talking about the fruit of salvation. What is the fruit of salvation? Obviously, it is good work. It is a serious thing to have accepted Christ as Savior and then to live in sin. You nullify what you do by being a spiritual baby, never growing up. In other words, retarded. Doing nothing in the world but building a big pile of wood, hay and stubble. Paul said the same thing in a different language in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, which says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Your salvation is a foundation. You rest upon it. But you also build upon it. You can build with six different kinds of materials. Wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, and precious stones. What kind of building materials are you using today? Are you building up a lot of wood, hay and stubble? There are a lot of programs and activities that we undertake which is merely wood, hay and stubble. We are great on committees, but do our lives really count for God? Are there going to be people in heaven who will be able to point to you and say, I am here because of you your life and testimony or I am here because you gave me the word of God or oh, let's guard against building with wood hay and stubble one man said I have to turn in a better report this year than the report in the previous year I have to increase the attendance and the membership and also 
the aspect of giving. Or if only people would realize that you've got to dig deep into the scriptures and also spend much time in God's word and in God's presence. There was this farmer who attended a conference which dealt on how to increase membership in the fellowship. He went rather annoyed to the organizers and said, It's strange that you have conferences on these kind of topics. As a farmer, he only attended conferences which dealt on what is the best kind of feed that is available for his cattle. The cattle obviously would go to the best feed that is available. Well, don't you think that could be applied in our fellowships as well? Too often we are focused on all the peripherals. We think of all kinds of gimmicks, but they really don't make a lasting impact. My dear friend, let's just focus on the main thing. It's the food, the spiritual nourishment that will draw people. It's not about working our head off, trying to draw people or force people or coerce people. When we give the right kind of food, obviously people will come. Attendance will increase. In John 15, the Lord Jesus talks about the fact that he is the vine, the genuine vine, and we are the branches. We are to bear fruit. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. John chapter 15 verses 7 to 8. He wants us to bear much fruit, not just a little fruit or no fruit. When there is a branch that won't bear fruit, what does he do? If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire. They are burned. This is verse 6. He will take it away. He will remove it from the place of fruit bearing. And that is what the Lord Jesus is saying. God is doing this very thing today. Looking back over the years, there have been many good men with wood, hay or stubble. And there are others who are filled with works that would be like gold, silver and precious stones. There was this layman who was a very prominent believer in Christ. He became involved in a dishonest transaction. And what happened? He lost his credibility and he lost his testimony. Though he was gifted and a likable person. Dear friend, that can happen. It takes years to build up a character. But then one moment of dropping down our guards can ruin everything that has been built over the years. We've got to be so careful. There was this minister who was attractive and he became unfaithful to his wife. And all the while he tried to keep on teaching. But his teaching didn't amount to anything. There was no result. There was no fruit. He was just putting up a lot of straw. It was just a big old haystack. But nothing worthwhile out of that. Oh, how careful we should be about our lives. We cannot live the life in our own strength. We need to recognize that Christ is the wine. If we have any life, it has to come from him. And if there is any fruit in our lives, it comes from him. We are sort of connecting rods as branches connecting to the vine and then bear fruit. Christ said that, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. John chapter 15 verse 4. If they shall fall away, or having fallen away, it is impossible to renew them to repentance. They then can shed tears all they want to, but they have lost their credibility or their testimony. For example, a preacher came and talked about his situation. He had moved away from this area and attempted to establish a huge service for God, but he failed. 
because he had an inappropriate relationship with a woman. He was true. We cannot question his salvation. He is a gifted man, no doubt about that, who could be mightily used by God, but right now is on the shelf because he lost his trust with God. Forgiveness is one thing. Trust is another. God forgives sin. No doubt about that. But then there is the trust. Trust takes time to develop. As you develop trust in another person, only then can you entrust more responsibilities. So a person who brings about distrust because of his behavior will probably lose that opportunity of serving God and he may be useless as such, not being able to do the great task that God has given him, not being able to reach up to his full potential. I hope that each one of us would never turn away from God's written standard and fall prey to sin because in doing so we lose out on the many and plenty opportunities that come our way. I hope that each one of us would be connected to the vine. For the land which hath drunk the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them for whose sake it is also tilled receiveth blessing from God. This is verse 7. The garden produce is a blessing to man. It is delicious. But if it beareth thorns and thistles, it is rejected and is nigh unto a curse whose end is to be burned. The same word used when writing to the Corinthian believers. Rejected. But I keep under my body and bring it under or into subjection, lest that by any means When I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. The word rejected and cast away is the same word in Greek, meaning not approved. In effect, Paul is saying, when I come into his presence, I don't want to be disapproved. I don't want the Lord Jesus to say to me, you have failed. Your life should have been a testimony, but it was not. Oh, my friend, you are going to hear that if you are not living for him. I know we don't want to hear these things. We need to face the facts, however. Now notice the key to this chapter. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Verse 9. The writer to the Hebrew believers is saying, I am persuaded that you are going to live for God and you are not going to remain babes in Christ, but will mature, will grow up. Now verse 10, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Work and labor of love won't save you. But if you are saved, this is why you are rewarded. This is where good works come in. Although they have nothing to do with your salvation, they certainly do play a very important role in a believer's life. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. We need that full assurance of hope unto the end. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. God has made a lot of promises to us if we are faithful to him. Verse 13, for when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. As you know, when you take an oath, you take it on something or someone greater than you are. Since there is nothing greater than God, he swore by himself, saying, surely blessing, I will bless thee and multiplying, I will multiply thee. God promised that to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 verses 15 to 18. Then in Hebrews 11, verse 19. And so, this is verse 15. After he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 15. There is something here that is quite wonderful. Abraham patiently endured. Think of that, 99 years he waited for that promised son. 
and a new assurance came by trusting God. When you trust God, you walk with Him. You grow in grace and in the knowledge of Him through the study of His word. This brings you to a place of assurance that cannot be gainsaid. For men verily swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. This is verse 16. When men confirm a statement with an oath, it is an end of every dispute. Verse 17. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. When God does a thing like this, he doesn't need to take an oath, but he does that to take one to make it very clear how important it is. In our age now, we are well on our way to trusting no one. Many of us have developed a kind of psychosis of distrust commonly known as the credibility gap. Young people are taught not to trust anyone but themselves and to learn everything by their own experience. Promises are often made very lightly with little intent of fulfilling them. A person's word today can seldom be his bond. Lying has all but become the norm in much of our society. The world is full of liars. There is that basic problem. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. 1 John chapter 5 verse 19. And Jesus tells us the evil one, the devil, is the father of lies. Lying is the essence of his nature. And here is God being doubly strong and sure that this is the truth. God is truth. He doesn't necessarily have to take an oath. But he is making that point very clear to each one of us that his word can be trusted. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. That by two immutable things. What is that? What are those two unchangeable things? The Lord promised Abraham's descendants as innumerable as the stars of heaven. Then later he confirmed his promise with an oath. Genesis chapter 22 verses 16 to 18. God confirmed his unchangeable word of promise by a second unchangeable thing. That is his oath. These two unchangeable things gave Abraham encouragement and assurance. Now, what are the two immutable things for each one of us today? Not only do we have the promise made to Abraham for our encouragement, but we have a far richer revelation of God's love in the gift of his Son. One, the death and resurrection of Christ, and two, his ascension and intercession for us are the two immutable things or unchangeable facts. These four great facts, death, resurrection, ascension and intercession, gives us an assurance that provide a refuge that we can lay hold upon. Who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us? This reminds us of the cities of refuge which God provided for the children of Israel. Numbers 35, Deuteronomy 19, Joshua chapter 20, right through to 21. Those cities of refuge serve as types of Christ sheltering the sinner from death. It was a very marvelous provision for a man who accidentally killed someone. Maybe the one whom he killed had a hot-headed brother who wanted vengeance. So the fugitive could escape to a city of refuge where he would be protected and his case tried. If he was acquitted of intentional killing, he must remain within the city until the death of the high priest. What a picture this is for us today. This reveals that Christ is our refuge. My friend, I have already been carried into court and at the trial I was found guilty. I was a sinner. The penalty which was leveled against me was death. 
and it has already been executed. Christ bore the penalty for me, you see, because he died in my place. I am free. I have been delivered from the penalty of sin. Never do I have to answer for it again. I am free now to go out and serve him. I now have a high priest, a resurrected Savior to whom I can go. What a wonderful picture of my Savior this gives. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Now all these things happened unto them for ensembles, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the end of the world are come. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11 Ensembles are types, and Melchizedek is a type of Christ. Millions of things could have been recorded, but God chose to record only these things because they enable us to grow in our understanding of Him and our relationship to Him. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, verses 19 to 20, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. When Christ ascended back to heaven, he assumed the priestly office, the office of the high priest, entered into that within the veil. Christ as high priest entered into the temple in heaven after which the earthly tabernacle was patterned. Hebrews 8 verse 5 He passed through the veil into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God, and presented his blood there. Then he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now one difference between Aaron and the Lord Jesus is this. I say this reverently. Aaron never did sit down. There were no seats in the tabernacle. There was the mercy seat, but that typified God's throne. Aaron only hurried in and hurried out. But you and I have a superior high priest. He has gone in, and what is he doing right now? He is seated. He has sat down. He has a finished redemption. Jesus Christ is the forerunner, which implies that there are others who are to follow. As an anchor of the soul we have an even stronger encouragement than Abraham had in his time because our high priest has entered in in advance into the presence of God for us and he is there today interceding for us. That's an anchor for the soul. Well, my dear friend, we've come to the close of our study. Thank you for joining us. I do trust that these verses would have strengthened and enabled you to get a firmer grasp of who you are in Christ and what he does in order to prove and to let us know that he could be trusted. Dear friend, trust God, it's worth it. God bless. I hope through today's lesson, you were able to learn about the faithfulness of God towards us if we persevere in faith. He is the one who helps us to persevere through all the spiritual resources He provides. Those spiritual resources are accessed as we trust God's Word and build our lives on it. His oaths help us to see beyond our limitations to His limitless power and provision. Our life is meaningful and lasting because of the hope that we have in Christ. As Paul states in Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you, my friend.